Welcome. Today I'm going to be playing a song for you that's called Easy to Remember. It's written by Rogers and Hart, a beautiful ballad. And I'm going to be playing a version that was recorded by Keith Jarrett with his trio live at the Deerhead Inn. So I'm going to be showing you the left hand voicings, mostly rootless voicings that he plays. So here we go with It's Easy to Remember by Rogers and Hart.
starting out, you want to understand how Keith Jarrett is reharmonizing the song. And secondly, how he's voicing the chords. So in the reharmonization part of it, I'm just going to give you the chords, and you can look at them on the sheet and see how they may differ from the original um, arrangement written by Rogers and Hart. But usually, everything that's happening in, in jazz interpretation involves two five ones or two fives. And so that's what's going on here. We're going like, uh, we're in the key of F, so we're, so we're going to start on the two chord, to the five chord, then the three chord, to the six chord, so a cycle of fifths on two fives, and then a two five one into the four chord, right? Then a two five there, and then a, a three six two five. So those kind of progressions are jazz progressions. You know, two five ones, three six two fives, these are typical jazz progressions, but now the voicings are interesting because mm -hmm. what we're doing is we're taking the root position of the chord now and we're inverting it. And so there's two essential inversions that we use most commonly. There's actually three inversions. So you have the root position on a G minor 7, and then you have its first inversion, then you have its second inversion, then you have its third inversion. So what happens on the first inversion is we drop the root, we just putting that note up on top. We drop the root, add the ninth. And then on the second inversion, going up here, we don't use that as much, but on the third inversion up here, now we're going to do the same thing. Drop the root in there and add the ninth. So those are the two preferred inversions. The first inversion, which has the ninth in it, and then the third inversion, which has also the ninth in it. So those two, that one and that one. And they vary between whatever you know chord you're playing. In other words, that doesn't sound so good in the third inversion, or maybe down there. But it doesn't sound so good on the first. Maybe it's, that's too high. So you have to you know change inversions based on what register in, because you want to keep most of the chords within that register. Most of the voicings in the drop in the uh, what I call rootless voicings, you want to keep in this middle register. So I might play G minor seven there. C minor 7 there, but I might play F minor 7 there. You know, rather than down there, I might play it there because it sounds good in that register, you see? So let's see, A minor 7 might sound best there, and not so good here. A little too high, so I might put the A, and then put the D. So what often happens is we alternate between, that's A, third inversion going to its relative five is a first inversion and then resolving to its one is a third inversion so you see that how, we, how do we know that is because the a minor seven when the seventh is on the bottom it's the third inversion and when the third is on the bottom bottom of a d7 it's the first inversion and then when the seventh is on the bottom of a g major chord, major nine, the seventh is on the bottom. There you see. So that's the key to it. But I'm going to show you the interlude that he plays after his solo in which the bass player and the drummer drop out and he plays this kind of thing that's very classical influence. It's like a neoclassic concept based on the same tune, the bridge of the song. So it goes like this. The C minor nine to the F Chord, but in this case now the F chord is played like with a sharp nine and with an augmented fifth here. So it's, it has a fourth voicing like that. Then it goes to the three of the chord, so it's very classical. And then he does this B flat diminished chord here, resolving to the B flat, because it is a two five one moving in the B flat, but it's it's very interesting. Obviously, his classical chops are coming out here. And then the, the, the sixth chord, but he does it like this. Opposing motion. Then the, then the C minor 7 flat 5 is like this. Voice like that. Very open spread. And then the flat 5 is played there. And then the F7 is like this. So it's like a, a suspension. It's like a... 4-3 and then a 
five here and a, a nine eight here and then it goes to another suspension suspended fourth like that which resolves there so it's a B flat suspended four like that and then he does another suspension here like a nine eight suspension so this is very classical now here the B flat minor seven chord on the bridge now becomes this voicing which is like a fourth voicing suspended another suspension resolving the E flat there so you can think of that as an E flat sus chord moving resolving like that and then this note comes in and the A flat resolves here to the res resolution with a nine there and then this very unusual chord, just like an inversion of an A flat major seven, and then it, then this three six two five in the key of C, like this, E half diminished, A minor seven, D minor seven, and then the C with another suspension, susp suspended fourth. So it's like almost like like a modern classical but I'm going to play the whole passage for you one more time Absolutely gorgeous. You should really check out the recording, and it's uh, this moment in the in the tune is a beautiful moment. And so um, there you have it. Uh, that's my analysis of the Keith Jarrett voicings for it's easy to remember, and I hope they'll be useful to you. Since this is a very important technique to learn for a pianist, if you want to play in a band or in a trio, I've dedicated a few pages in book two of my book. Volume 2, Chapter 20 on Rootless Voicings. So here you have a description of the theory and how they're created. You have the A form and the B form. Then you have a cycle of fifths exercise using the rootless voicings. And then you have examples and a song to play so that you have the application of the technique. You have a couple of songs here written out for you with the rootless voicings. So it's very practical and it's in a three ring binder which is, is really practical and useful for taking pages out and lies flat on the music stand.